Hello again. Is it is it okay if I take this off? The stand? Yes. Cool. Awesome. Thank you again. Thank you for reading that so well, Marilyn. That was awesome. I felt like you really brought us into what David is feeling in this psalm. It was awesome. And I just want to say thank you again for having me here. Thank you again for Michael for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to open God's word with uh, God's people this morning here at Clempton Park. It's awesome. When Michael asked me to speak, he said, Brayden, you can speak for any chapter in the Bible. And so I turned to my, to my senior minister at um, our church and I said, Andrew, what do you think I should do in this? I've never kind of been given the opportunity to preach from anything in the whole Bible. And he said, well, when I was a student, I just picked my favorite psalm and kind of preached on it whenever someone offered me to preach from anything in the Bible. And so historically, Psalm 13 has been my favorite psalm. It has kind of been the psalm that as a teenager, I would go to when I, when I was doubting or when I was going through a hard time or whether I, when I was confused about something, because I think something that Psalm 13 does, and I think this is one of the reasons it was particularly special to me, was because in times of, of that suffering or doubt or confusion, it teaches us that we can actually still rejoice in the midst of those times. So I've kind of, I've kind of called this, as you can see, rejoice in the midst of dot, dot, dot. Because I think one of the beauties of this psalm is that it actually allows and enables us to kind of insert something at the end of that sentence that we might be going through in our own life. Insert the, the suffering we might be going through in our own life. The doubt we might be going through in our own life. And we can say that we can rejoice in the midst of that. And I think also this psalm tells us that we can respond the way David does. And we'll see that. I want to take us through that in three progressions I think this psalm has. The first, and I've got, this is the first time ever in a sermon I've actually been able to have my points with the, the starting letter as the same thing. So I'm very excited about this. The petitions, so despair in suffering, the plea, the cry in suffering, and the praise, the response in suffering. So I'm going to get straight into it. I might pray before we get through those points and then we'll, we'll get into it. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you reveal to us all we need to know of you through your word. Father, as we come to it now, help us to have open hearts ready to hear what you have to say to us, that you might correct us, change us, teach us in righteousness, Lord, and that we might follow you in greater godliness uh, as we live for the Lord Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. So, firstly, the petitions, verses 1 and 2, this kind of despair in suffering. The psalm opens with these, these four how longs. How long, Lord? How long, Lord? How long? And, and, and he says, how long will you forget me forever? How long will, will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and each day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? How long? I think what David's doing here is he's painting a picture of all-encompassing, total suffering that he is going through. He is desperate. He, he's in despair. How long? With this psalm, unlike some others, we're not really sure what kind of suffering is actually happening for David at this point in his life. We know from other parts of the Old Testament that David went through a lot of, of suffering in his life, but when it comes to Psalm 13, they're not sure when this, he would have kind of written this or what he would have been going through. But I actually don't think that that matters that much when it comes to this psalm because he's really trying to paint this picture of total suffering. And it's kind of leaving it open to say, this is kind of the experience that many go through when they're going through a really, really, really hard time. And, and I think with these four how long statements or questions, he's actually providing for us three categories of suffering. The first is, I think, a spiritual one. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? He begins this psalm looking for God. God, have I fallen off your radar? God, can, can you see what I'm going through at the moment? God, I, I, are you around? What's going on? God. God, you promised to me that, that my name would be great. You actually promised in 2 Samuel, God promises that his love will never be taken away from David. David. 
was like, where are you? What, what happened to that promise? We ask these same questions, don't we? God, what's going on? Where are you in this, God? Or maybe, maybe it's, how can you let this happen to me? God, where is the light at the end of the tunnel? But David, he goes further. He doesn't just say, will you forget me forever? He actually takes this spiritual element of suffering further. He says, how long will you hide your face from me? He moves past just speaking about God as forgetting him. David's claiming that God's actually, he's done something intentional. He's actually hiding from David. In David's mind, he feels that God has actually turned from him. Kind of, he's painting this picture of rejection from God. And we ask these same questions too in hardship. Why are you doing this to me, God? God, why do you let this happen? God, have I done something wrong that you're making my life miserable right now? Sometimes we're led to ask these types, or we feel like we need to ask these questions when we're going through those really deep and dark times. It's a spiritual element to David's suffering here. The second element to David's suffering, I think, is mental. He associates it to his mind and his heart. How long, Lord, will I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? David's experience of suffering is causing him to have these etern- internal sorry, thoughts within his own head and heart. The ESV says it this way, that, uh, says that first phrase this way, how long must I take counsel in or with my soul? We're getting this picture, David's uh, kind of painting this picture of, an, of just, he's uh, wrestling, he's working in his own mind, trying to answer questions about the situation that he's going through. Why, why is this going on? Why is this happening to me? Happening to, happening to me? How, how did I get here? How did this end up happening? We do that when we're going through a tough time. We internalize these things. We, we try to work it out in our head like we're doing a, a problem solving. And for David, his heart is actually just filled with sorrow. This, this endeavor of internalizing in his mind, it seems that it doesn't lead anywhere except sorrow. And I feel like that is often true with us too. In our own suffering, no matter how hard we often try to figure out the reasons behind it, what's going on, we're often just left in a sense, in a situation of of despair. And the final element that I think David is painting in this picture of suffering is a physical one. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Perhaps it is this physical circumstance, this situation, whatever it is, that is actually driving David into this this period of suffering. We don't know. David's life was filled with, with heaps of times and situations where his life was actually at risk. He was faced with death on many occasions. God, how long is my life going to be under threat for? This may be another way we could read this. His physical well-being is in jeopardy. And he desires relief from it. You know, and, and we, we feel that too. There's physical situations, circumstances that might be beyond our control. And I'm not just talking about like physical pain. I'm talking about the circumstances and the realities in our life that bring about hardship. And we, and we just want relief from them. Can this just end? And this is really the summary of these petitions. Can this just be over? How long, Lord? Our suffering does this to us. We question our relationship with God. God, where are you? What's going on? We question things and try to rationalize in our own mind. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? And then we look at these physical circumstances and we just say, how long is this going to be going for? When is this going to end? How long? So that first section, verses 1 and 2, paints this picture of all-encompassing suffering. When we go through a hard situation, it kind of affects all these aspects of our life that David is painting in the first two verses of this psalm. But then he moves to the plea. He has this cry in suffering, verses 3 and 4. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. 
And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. My foes will rejoice when I fall. So he's moved from that picture of utter despair that we painted, and he's come to a plea. He's crying out to God, and he cries out in three ways. Look on me, answer, and give light or enlighten. Give light to my eyes. David is asking, he's actually asking for deliverance here. He wants God to reveal himself to to him, and ultimately, I think that spiritual element that I first talked about That's the thing he wants deliverance from ultimately. And I think we see this in that third part of the cry. Give light to my eyes, especially that bit. Because what David's doing there is actually qualifying the first two. So he's saying, look on me and answer, give light to my eyes. That second one clarifies that first one. And the word that gets translated, give light to my eyes there, is only used another three times in the Old Testament. And two of them... I think really help us to understand what David means when he says, give light to my eyes. One is in Psalm 19, which is a pretty famous psalm, where where David again is kind of listing off all these amazing qualities of God's word. And to one of them, he says that God's word is radiant and it gives light to my eyes. The second time, another time that this word's used in the Old Testament is in the book of Ezra, where Ezra is bringing God's people back from exile And he's praying to them as he's grieving over their sin. And he kind of looks to that remnant, that that small group of people that God has saved from exile. And and, and he says, God has given light to their eyes and relief from their bondage. So Ezra, he attaches this give light to my eyes to the image of deliverance. And David in Psalm 9 relates it to the revelation, God's word being revealed. So I think in Psalm 13, we can use that to understand this, this phrase, what David's saying here is, God, can you, can you reveal yourself to me so that I might be delivered? Because the big thing that he started the whole psalm with was, how long will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? He said, God, show up again. God, reveal yourself to me again so that I can be delivered from this suffering. That's the picture we're getting from these pleas. And for us, in the midst of an utter desperation, just like David, the only place to go is to God. In David's mind, deliverance is found in knowing God, in seeing him again, in being in relationship with God, in having God give light to his eyes. Reveal yourself to me so I may be delivered. I have a younger brother and there's an eight-year gap between us. So I kind of got to see a little bit of him growing up as like a baby and, and remember it well enough. And I, I remember when Josiah, is his name, when he was happy and having a good time, it didn't really matter who he was around. He would be happy to play with you, happy to hang out with you, whatever. But as soon as something went wrong, and as soon as Josiah was upset or hurt or whatever, and he would start crying, there was only one person he wanted to be around, and that was mum. He'd want to come. come. I'd, I'd even be there sometimes like, Josiah, it's okay. I'll, I'll help you out. And he'd be like, no, it'll make it worse. I just need mum. He had this tunnel vision in those times of hurt for our mum. And I think we've kind of got to adopt this childlike response here in our times of suffering and despair. Just go to God. We've got to have that tunnel vision like David does. Give light to my eyes, God. I just want this relationship. In the midst of our suffering, we've got to go to God. We must cry out to him like David does. Give light to my eyes. Reveal yourself to me. Don't forget me, God. Remember me. He doesn't really ask all the clarifying questions. He doesn't ask for all the details, the hows and the, and the what ifs. We are so good at asking the what ifs. No, David goes to that initial question about hiding his face and he says, show me you, God. Show me you. But why? Why is that the solution to his suffering? 
Well, he tells us the first reason so that he won't sleep in death. And the second, so that his enemy cannot rejoice at his downfall. The deliverance that David desires is a deliverance from death. He's facing death. And it isn't too hard, I guess, to see why that would be a motivation. Often, you know, especially I think in our day and age, we are, we don't even like talking about death a lot of the time. The motivation is to avoid it at all costs. But I think what, what, what is important for us to, to see here is where David turns in the face of death. And that's not to try and deliver himself with his own hands, but seek God for deliverance. Now, I personally have never been confronted with my own death. I have had to administer CPR, which feels quite you know, terrifying when you sort of feel like you have another person's life in your hands. But that would sort of be the closest thing. In the face of his own death, though, and David knows that feeling very powerfully because he's had to confront it many times, he turns to God. He realises, my deliverance is not in my own hands. It's in the hands of another. It's in the hands of God. And guys, our lives are not in our own, as well, in our own hands as well. They're in God's. I just want to press that a bit further. I don't want to leave us here thinking that our concern needs to be about our life here on earth. That our, concern, our concern should be for our eternal destiny, our eternal life or death. And we must, must realise that as for David, his deliverance was found in God's alone. Our eternal deliverance is found also in God alone. Deliverance in eternity is found in God alone alone through his saving work in his son Jesus Christ so it is to Jesus alone we must turn to for our deliverance in times of hardship and the second reason David gives and I think this one's a bit more a bit more confusing is so that his enemy might not triumph over him I remember I said before God made his covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7 and in verse 11 of that chapter God says that part of the covenant, he will give David rest from his enemies. And then in Psalm 2, which which when you're reading the book of Psalms, is a very important psalm to kind of have in the back of your mind as we're going through the book of Psalms. In Psalm 2, the, the writer of the psalm gives this expectation that someone will come and defeat the nations, defeat Israel's enemies. So we've been set up both by God in the covenant and by the writer of Psalm 2, that there is this expectation that us as the reader and David himself as the one writing, this expectation of defeating enemies. So I think David is essentially, he's making an appeal here to the very nature of God, to his promises, to say to God, what you promised to me is in peril. If you don't deliver me, my enemies will rejoice. You said that wouldn't happen. David wants God to reveal himself for deliverance so that God may remain true to his promises. Do you ever appeal to God on the basis of his promises? God has promised you, if you're a follower of Jesus, eternal life. When you cry out to God, are you coming with that as your motivation and your certainty that you're going to eternal life in paradise? Do you cry out to God on the basis of the certain hope you have in salvation through Jesus' work? God promises those who follow him the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you cry out to God with the confidence that comes with knowing that God dwells within you? in the form of his spirit, in the person of his spirit. The promises of God should give us great motivation and willingness to cry out to him in our suffering. And that's why it's so important that when we're not in a time of hardship, we're not in a time of peril or suffering, to actually ground ourselves firmly in those truths. Because when suffering does come, and the Bible tells us that it will come, We have a solid foundation in the word of God to be able to know upon which promises we can cry out to our loving Father. 
The last section, the praise. This response in suffering that we see in verses 5 to 6. I love this bit. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Now it seems like there's a bit of a gear shift here. You know, we've, been given, we've been painted this massive picture of despair. We've seen David's plea. And then suddenly he's all happy and kind of joyful and praising God. And it seems like that doesn't quite match up. It seems like something should have happened in between. But what has, what, what has happened to suddenly make David start praising God? Nothing. Nothing has happened between four, verses 4 and 5. There is no indication in the text that David has actually been relieved of his suffering. There's no indication that God has kind of answered this prayer and delivered him from the situation. I don't think this is a joyful response of a man because his despair or his suffering has been alleviated. I think we've got to, we've got to be careful to avoid reading that into the text. That it's some sort of, I don't know, answer, answer to prayer here and then David's responding to having his prayer answered. I don't think that's what's going on. The text doesn't actually give any indication that he's been lifted out of suffering. And I think this is actually important to remember because it means we can't say things like, uh, it means we can't say things like, you know, David prayed, so God took away his suffering. So if we pray like David, God will take away our suffering. It means we can't say things like that. Or, or, or we can't say things like, we can only respond to God in praise when he alleviates our suffering. We can't say things like that. Now, David's praise at the end of this psalm comes in the midst of his suffering, whilst he's there in it, confronting it, asking those difficult questions we saw in the first four verses. David is saying, despite the situation, I trust in your unfailing love. Despite what I'm going through, despite what's going on, I trust in your unfailing love. And I think this is why I find, or what I find so precious about this psalm. That in the midst of suffering, we can still rejoice in God. We can still rejoice in our Saviour and His salvation. I think something that's really cool in this psalm is we get to see those three elements again. The spiritual, mental, and physical. The first, it's that unfailing love of God. It's faith. It's God's love. That David places his trust in, his security in, his faith in, his hope in. The God who he feels has forgotten him, who has hidden his face from him. The way he feels, David knows God's unfailing love, so he still trusts in God. That second element, he's praising with his heart. His heart rejoices in God's salvation. Where there was sorrow in his heart in verse 2. Now there's rejoicing in the salvation of God, the saving acts of God in the past. David is probably calling to mind things that he knows from the history of his people, like the Exodus or other situations where David has been saved because of what God's done. And he can rejoice in those. God saved, past tense. So he can save in the present and the future. And so David can trust uh, and he can rejoice in that in his heart. In that third element, the physical element, David's praise is sung. He sings praises to God. Where there were enemies triumphing over him, in verse 2, there is a physical response here of praise in verse 6. David sings. And funnily enough, this, this psalm was written to the choir master, the director of music. This psalm would have been sung, probably the whole thing. David has a physical response of praise in the midst of his suffering. And just to wrap up, I just want to draw two more quick things from this about how we can respond similarly. So firstly, God is worthy of praise in the midst of our suffering because of his love, his unfailing love, because of his salvation and because of his goodness. For David, he looked back into Israel's history, the Exodus, 
events like that, to see God's great acts of salvation. And he knew he could trust in that unfailing love. For us, we look back to Christ, the greatest demonstration of salvation, the greatest demonstration of unfailing love, and the greatest demonstration of God's goodness there in the cross of Christ. God's unfailing love, it's seen in the death of his own son in our place, so that we might be saved, so that God might no longer hide his face from us, so that we can one day dwell in paradise forever, face to face with the true and living God. God's salvation achieved his death in our place, Christ's death in our place saves us from our sin. He takes the punishment, salvation achieved. Let your heart rejoice in that. And the goodness of God on display as Christ rises from the dead, confirming our own resurrection from the dead one day to receive an inheritance where there will be no more crying, no more mourning, and no more pain. True goodness. So in your suffering, turn to this. Turn to this truth that we see in the work, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember these things and praise God in the midst for his work in Christ on your and my behalf. And the coming glory into which he will bring us. It's good news. The second thing that I think we can take away from this is this is somewhere we can take people when we're walking through suffering with others. Sometimes people in our life are going through terrible, our lives are going through terrible situations, and we're the ones who need to walk with them. And the cross of Christ is a place, is the place we should take them. David, in the midst of his suffering, goes to the love, salvation, and goodness of God. So it seems a fantastic place for us to take people who are suffering in our lives as well. To reassure them, to help them, to praise this God who has saved them. And I want to say, I don't actually just mean Christians. I think at this point, it's it's helpful to say that we can take people who don't yet believe. I think we're probably doing them a disservice if we actually don't. We truly believe that this is the way to true deliverance and salvation through Christ alone. And if we want to offer people deliverance in the midst of whatever they're going through, truly Christ, we believe, is also the answer for them too. We have a psalm that begins with these petitions, paints a picture of utter desperation and despair, moves to a series of pleas, David is asking that God might reveal himself to him so that he might be delivered. And then we finish in the midst of suffering still with rejoicing because of God's love, salvation, and goodness. So let's rejoice too with David in the midst due to Christ's salvation. I might just pray to close. Father God, we give you thanks for your word again. We thank you for this psalm and for David and the way that he responded to you in the midst of suffering and that we get to read about it and hear it here. Lord, help us in our suffering to turn to Christ and to turn to his great works of salvation for us. Help us to remember the glory that we will enter and the sacrifice which enables it. Lord God, help us when we're walking in suffering with other people who are going through tough times to be bold to take them here to, to show them the deliverance and the love and salvation and goodness displayed in Jesus. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.